How can you love one person and sleep with another? How is that even possible? And do you believe in it? My wife and I were fine. Children, home, stable job. My wife did not give me any reason to worry. The only thing we had problems in bed life, and only after more than 20 years I realized what was really the matter. On a Friday, I had to drive across town to deliver urgent files from my precinct to police headquarters. I'd been desk-bound for the past two weeks due to a shooting incident involving my partner and me. The shooting was justified. We confronted a suspect leaving who aimed a gun at us. And it was actually Jim who fired the shot, not me. Nonetheless, both of us were confined to desk duty until the Internal Affairs Division completed their investigation, leaving me thoroughly bored. With little else to occupy my time, I decided to detour by my house on the way. Helen had prepared a delicious brisket for dinner the previous night, and I thought I'd turn some of the leftovers into a sandwich for lunch. It was only a short deviation from my route, and I knew nobody at the precinct would be concerned about the time I took to complete my errand. As I drove slowly along my street, I parked my car across from Mrs. Ferguson's house to admire her beautiful flower garden. She dedicated eight months of the year to tending to it, and it was always a sight to behold. Just as I was preparing to continue the final fifty yards to my own house, I looked up and was surprised to see a man exiting my front door. It was Mark Malchek, a resident from around the corner, known as some sort of computer expert who worked remotely. I couldn't help but wonder what he was doing leaving my house at 11.30 in the morning. I observed as he casually strolled around the corner and disappeared from view. Then I parked in front of my house and went inside. The house was silent, but I thought I heard the sound of a shower running upstairs. As I ascended the stairs and entered my bedroom, I received an unpleasant surprise. The bed was in ruins. Pillows, sheets, and blankets were scattered on it, and there was a large wet spot in the center. There was clearly someone sweating heavily in the room, which left no doubt about what Mark Malchek was doing in my house. From the bathroom, the sound of the shower running reached me, accompanied by Helen's cheerful singing, a familiar sign of her contentment. Damn it! Anger surged within me, poised to drown out my profound disbelief. Was my wife engaging in an affair with some neighbor behind my back? Helen and I had been married for 24 years and I believed our marriage was quite content. We first crossed paths when I was still attending the police academy. She was assisting with catering at my cousin's wedding, and she immediately caught my eye as the most adorable girl I had ever seen. She was petite, charmingly attractive, not stunningly beautiful, but with an amazing physique. Through some flirting, I managed to obtain her phone number, and after about a year of dating, we tied the knot. For the most part, our marriage had been wonderful. I was employed by the department while Helen pursued her career in catering, often taking on freelance projects for a company owned by a high school friend. This arrangement allowed her to have a flexible schedule, enabling her to be an involved mother to our two daughters, Linda and Veronica. Linda had since graduated from college and was working in Chicago, while Veronica was a junior at Kenyon. They were exceptional kids and Helen had been an outstanding mother to them. Helen and I shared a deep bond, our values aligned, our family priorities matched, and we genuinely enjoyed each other's company. When we encountered other couples who seemed disinterested in each other, we exchanged knowing smiles. We were still having a blast together after two decades, never running out of conversation topics. I felt incredibly fortunate, except for one aspect. One of these aspects was our bed life. Helen was undeniably attractive and had a captivating charm. I will always remember the thrill with which I first saw her body after several months of dating. However, she just wasn't prone to bed intimacy. After our courtship and the first months of marriage, I soon realized with disappointment that Helen was content with intimacy only once every ten days or so. This was in stark contrast to the three, four times a week frequency with which we started our marriage, and I did not hesitate to express my displeasure. Over the years, we have faced this problem more often than any other. For a while, we even sought help from a family psychologist, especially when our daughters were young. After many years of disappointment and unhappiness, I finally realized that my wife truly loves me. Her lack of interest in bed intimacy with me was not personal. 
It was simply due to a low interest in it. The counselor helped me deal with my anger and helped Helen realize the need for additional efforts on her part. Thus, what was once a frequency of once every ten days evolved to perhaps once a week, occasionally twice if I could persuade her. I held on to hope that as our daughters departed for college and we gained more free time, no longer shuttling them to various activities like voice lessons, tennis practice, dances, or friends' houses, our situation might improve. However, this hope was never fulfilled. It became an even more difficult task. Our intimacy turned into a depressingly quick meeting. I dreamed of tenderness, affection. However, most of the time she resisted my advances. She would, as if defending herself. Not today, honey, can we just do it quickly? I didn't understand at all what was wrong. Don't women usually want more foreplay? Just imagine the disappointment when you can't properly enjoy your wife for three months. You may be tempted to judge her harshly by thinking, why stay with a person who doesn't meet your needs? But the truth is that Helen and I have a deep love and mutual appreciation. Despite her lack of bed enthusiasm, she shows her affection for me in countless ways every day. We imagine a future in which we will grow old together. It's just that bed life is not an important aspect of our relationship. And over time, thanks to my own efforts, I've found ways to deal with it. That's why when I staggered down the stairs and out the front door, I was both shocked and furious. I knew that Helen loved me, and I trusted her completely, knowing that she wasn't interested enough in intimacy to cheat on me. So what the hell is going on? It took me less than three minutes to get to Mark Malchek's house and ring his doorbell. When he opened the door, a crack and looked at me uncertainly, saying, Hi, Rob, what are you? I pushed the door hard, causing him to fall to the floor. Closing the door behind me, I grabbed him and hit him with my knee, causing him to double over in pain. When I picked him up again, I was pleased to see his pale, frightened face. He couldn't even speak. Holding him by the collar with my left hand, I struck him several times. In conclusion, I delivered a final, crushing blow. I threw Mark onto the couch in the living room, watching him try to get some air, and gently hugged him around the neck. Listen carefully, you worthless person. I know exactly where you were and what you were doing this morning, and I'm on edge. I have a gun and a shovel. He was silent, just looked at me with fear in his eyes. Now you're going to tell me everything I want to know, answer all my questions. Then you'll clean yourself up and get on with your life. And you will never, under any circumstances, Talk to Helen again. Do you understand me well enough? I squeezed his neck slightly to get his attention, and he nodded frantically. Yes, yes, Rob, I understand, he whispered. He was completely intimidated. After releasing him, I invited him to start talking. I made it clear to him that it was better for him to tell everything, not hiding anything and not downplaying his actions, and he confessed everything. He and Helen had been in a bed relationship for more than two months. Surprisingly, he claimed that she was the initiator of this. During a neighborhood meeting on July 4th, she openly flirted with him when they were alone. A few days later, she called him in the morning and asked him to help move the filing cabinet. When he arrived, she met him in just a bathrobe. Expressing her gratitude, she kissed him passionately at the door, hugged him tightly and touched him. Before he could voice his concerns, they were in our bedroom. I was amazed by his revelations. Helen was full of enthusiasm and looked forward to every meeting with him. Mark claimed that he repeatedly asked her, Are you sure this is all right? What about Rob? I can't confirm if this is true, but he insisted that she assured him that she would be able to keep it a secret from me. Since their first meeting, they have met several times a week either at my place or at Mark's. This morning, he said, when I went to her house, she met me at the door. We went upstairs, and it happened again. Listening to Mark's story, I could only sit back, not believing my ears. The woman I believed I had been married to for 24 years bore no resemblance to the woman who had been enthusiastically dating Mark since the summer. One last inquiry. Then you can attend to your mess. I can't fathom you being the first man she's fooled around with in this manner. Did she disclose anything about others? Without hesitation... He was completely broken by now. She hinted that there were a few before me, 
but she only mentioned one. Joe something, Oberman or Olderman, he's a firefighter. She said he ended things because his wife was becoming suspicious. Joe Olderman. He and Stephanie had been close friends of ours since our daughters were five. That despicable jerk. Both Helen and I were fortunate that I had the afternoon to compose myself and regain control. Helen's luck lay in the fact that I could have harmed her, while mine was in avoiding a lengthy prison sentence. By the time I returned home for dinner, I had managed to contain my anger. Helen remained cheerful and affectionate as usual. We enjoyed a delightful meal, discussing mundane topics such as the children's well-being, upcoming catering events for her, and the monotony of my desk job. Remarkably, I was able to mask my simmering fury behind a facade of normalcy. Later, as she lay in bed watching a rerun of CSI, I joined her. Naturally, the bedroom had been restored to its pristine state, fresh sheets and all. I leaned over to kiss her cheek, slipping my hand under her nightgown to caress her thigh. She cast a cautious glance at me and replied, Not tonight, darling, all right? I'm feeling a bit exhausted. How about we just relax and watch some TV together? Normally this would prompt me to retreat, maybe with a hint of disappointment, but not tonight. I persisted, gently moving my hand upwards and insisted, No, I really need you tonight. Honey, come on, you'll enjoy it. Rob, she uttered, sounding irritated. I really want to, Helene, and it's only 9.30. You can't be that tired, she looked at me and said, I don't want to. While maintaining eye contact with her, I softly suggested, What if you imagine I'm Mark Malchek? Her body tensed slightly in surprise, an unexpected oh escaping her lips as she stared at me, wide-eyed. It was a look I'd never seen on her face during our entire time together. As a result, she agreed to intimacy without words, and I give my word. We have never had this. After that, I got out of bed. Without saying a word to Helen or even looking back, I headed for the shower. When I came out fifteen minutes later, drying my hair with a towel, Helen was sitting up in bed again. She made the bed, put on her nightgown again, and combed her hair. I can tell she was crying. She looked at me sadly. Rob, I'm so... She started with a wavering voice, but I interrupted her. Let me speak first, Helen. I paused for a moment, staring at her icily. I went to the house earlier today, just before lunch, and I saw Mark Malchek leaving. Then I came upstairs and heard you in the shower, and noticed the state of our bedroom. So, spare me any excuses or attempts to deceive me, okay? Her head hung low, a blush creeping across her cheeks. She nodded silently. I'm not sure if our marriage can weather this storm, she gasped, her eyes widening in horror. But if there's any chance... It starts with you being completely honest with me. Do you understand? Helen nodded again, tears welling up. I'm so sorry, Rob. I can't believe I've done something so terrible. She paused, overcome by sobs. All I ask is for you to give me one more chance. I'll tell you everything, but please don't hate me. Fine, then, the whole truth about you and that guy. What happened? Where? When? How? For how long? And why? She sobbed for a while longer, then wiped away her tears. I never really noticed him until the July 4th picnic. Suddenly he was always there, bringing me drinks or hot dogs, being overly friendly. A few times when you weren't around, he would start flirting, stare at me, and even touch my back with a hint. But that was a few months ago, and I completely forgot about it until last week. He called and asked if he could come and help with the recipe he was preparing for his new girlfriend. So he came and we worked on the recipe together. I explained something to him and he was very grateful. We had a cup of coffee and then I felt strange. Before I knew it, he carried me upstairs to the bedroom. You know? She paused, tears streaming down her face again. I felt disoriented. I couldn't figure out why this was happening or why he didn't stop when I said no. He, a real monster. After he finished, he confessed that he had put something in the coffee and showed me his digital camera. He took a picture of use, Rob. The doer, this. And he threatened that I should keep seeing him. Otherwise, he would make sure that you and all your friends at the station got copies of these photos. Rob, I was so confused that I didn't know what to do. 
I listened impassively, though internally skeptical. It seemed likely she was weaving a web of lies, but I decided to hear her out nonetheless. Unbeknownst to her, I had already conversed with Mark. He phoned last week, stating he'd return today at 10.30 a.m., insisting I prepare for his arrival. I was petrified about the incriminating photos, so I allowed it. I mean, he showed up, and we repeated what happened. I exhaled heavily. Helen, why didn't you inform me after the initial incident? Do you not realize we could have tested your blood and had him prosecuted for assault? She cast her eyes downward. I see that now. I suppose I wasn't thinking clearly. I was just terrified of your reaction. Both towards me and him. Oh, Rob, I was so scared. And so lost. Tears streamed down her face. I'm truly sorry, darling. A fanciful narrative, I mused silently. Implausible yet not entirely implausible. If one could entertain the notion that Mark Malchek would be foolish enough and assault a police officer's spouse. Yet the account he provided during our confrontation seemed more credible, despite contradicting my perception of my wife. Then there was the most damning evidence of all, the sound of Helen cheerfully singing in the shower mere minutes after Malchek allegedly coerced her into another encounter. I pondered further, staring out the window while Helen sniffled and wiped her eyes. You've acted foolishly, Helen. After 25 years together, I expected more trust from you. She glanced at me sheepishly, repeating, I'm so sorry, Rob. I need some time to consider how to address this, perhaps a few days. During this period, refrain from speaking to Mark or anyone else about this. Understood? Okay, she agreed, suddenly hopeful. Please, Rob, don't do anything risky. Leaning forward, I studied her face. Helen... Be honest with me now. Has this been the only instance of infidelity in our marriage? She attempted to meet my gaze, but her eyes flickered away momentarily. With my experience interrogating suspects, I knew what that meant. There's been no one else, darling. No one but you, until... Until Mark... Her tears flowed again, and she didn't finish the sentence. The blatant falsehood reignited my anger instantly. I rose from the bed and began pacing around the bedroom. In case it's not abundantly clear, my dear wife, I'm extremely displeased with you at the moment. You'll be sleeping in the guest room tonight, so gather your belongings and leave. Rob, I... Did I not make myself clear, I interrupted with more intensity. I'm finished discussing this with you tonight, now get out of here. But darling, I... Go... With a small gasp, she hastily grabbed her bathrobe and exited the bedroom. I settled back into bed to watch a football game for an hour before drifting off to sleep. I was surprised by how well I slept last night, even though Helen wasn't beside me as usual. I suppose releasing some tension a couple of times might have helped. As I descended the stairs, the aroma of brewing coffee filled the air. Entering the kitchen, I discovered that Helen had gone all out for breakfast. There were pancakes, sausages, scrambled eggs, and even freshly squeezed orange juice. Helen stood at the counter, pouring my coffee, her expression appearing wan and fearful. Good morning, sweetie, she greeted me timidly, handing me the cup. Hello, Helen, I responded neutrally. This breakfast looks wonderful. We ate together, engaging in light conversation, and I observed Helen gradually easing her tension. Once I was satisfied, I pushed my chair back from the table and stood up. There was only one way to uncover the truth, and I wasted no time in pursuing it. Informing Helen that I needed some alone time, I swiftly made my way to my basement workshop before driving directly to Joe Olderman's house. As I pulled up, I noticed him walking towards his front door with the mail. I invited him to accompany me for a while to inspect the new car that I was going to purchase, and we set off heading towards Forbes Avenue. Where the car dealerships were, I turned onto a quiet side street and pulled into a secluded parking lot behind the football field. Joe stared absently out the window. Suddenly he turned to me, puzzled, and exclaimed, Rob, why are we here? What the hell is this? My service revolver was pointed six inches from his face. 
You despicable jerk. We've been friends for over 15 years, but that didn't stop you from betraying me with Helen, did it? His face paled, and he instinctively recoiled from me. Rob, I... I... Who are you? I've never... Stop it, you idiot. I talked to Helen, and she told me the whole story. I'm so close to pulling the trigger that you'll disappear without a trace. He gave in. It was written all over his face in an instant. Realizing Helen had already spilled the beans, he saw no point in denying it. Instead, he scrambled to cover himself. Rob, I swear it wasn't my fault. She kept coming on to me over and over. I kept telling her we were just friends. It wasn't right, but she wouldn't back off. I lowered the gun slightly, observing his deep breath and the sweat beating on his forehead. Fear filled his eyes. Tell me everything, slowly and carefully, and don't omit a single detail. If your story doesn't align perfectly with Helen's, I'll make your cheating look like an accident. He eagerly complied, desperate to avoid the consequences. His version mirrored Mark's. Helen had been the aggressor. With our families spending much time together, Helen had escalated their usual banter about a year ago. She began making physical advances, even when others weren't looking. Eventually, she propositioned him over the phone. Despite initially rejecting her advances, or so he claimed, her persistence wore him down until he gave in. Rob, he began carefully, since you wanted to hear the whole story, I'm going to tell it. Just, uh, put the gun down, okay? I nodded, signaling him to continue. She was the most attractive woman I've ever dated. I've never had such intimacy as with her. How long has this been going on? I asked in a low and threatening tone. About eight months. We met once or twice a week. I was always afraid you'd find out about it. Then Stephanie began to suspect something, to act strangely, as if she somehow sensed that I was going astray. In the end, I convinced Helen that we should stop. It was last June. How did she react? She was annoyed, but she put up with it because she didn't want Stephanie to find out. She even made a joke. Well, I guess I'll just have to find someone else to take your place, Joe. Have you ever asked her why she cheated on me? Yes, many times. Even before we started, I asked her, Why do you want to do this? And what did she say? Nothing that really makes sense. Just that she loved you, that you were a great guy, but she needed something more. Do you think you were her first lover? No, she mentioned a couple of other guys she was in a relationship with. I didn't know any of them. I think she met one of them when she was serving a party or something. I leaned back and observed him. He averted his gaze, staring out the window. After a moment, I spoke up, saying, You really are despicable, you know that? I don't care how much she flirted with you. There was only one right thing to do, and you did the exact opposite. He lowered his head, avoiding eye contact. I suspected he was secretly relieved that I wasn't going to harm him. Our friendship is done, jerk. Get out of the car. Here. But it's at least ten miles to... His words trailed off when he saw the expression on my face. Quietly, he exited the car and walked a few paces away. Without another word, I turned the car around and headed back to town. I returned directly to Joe and Stephanie's place, fortunate to find Stephanie there. Hi, Rob. Weren't you with Joe just now? She inquired, peering past me to the vacant car. Yeah, but something came up. Listen, can we chat for a bit? Perplexed, she guided me to the kitchen and we settled with cups of coffee. Steph, we've been friends for a long time, and there's no easy way to say this. Joe and Helen had an affair. What? She gaped at me, then shook her head. Rob, I might have believed you if you mentioned Joe and someone else. I had a suspicion last spring that something was going on. But Helen? No way. I retrieved the mini-recorder from my shirt pocket, which I had discreetly placed before leaving the house. Without uttering another word, I rewound it and pressed play. We sat silently, listening together to my entire conversation with Joe. Several times I felt like crying, and I knew the tears would come later, but I maintained my composure. I observed Steph as her expression hardened, her lips tightening into an angry frown. 
I surmised that her marriage with Joe was probably as over as mine was. After the tape ended, we sat in silence for a few moments. Then I inquired whether any of what we just heard made sense to her. Not really, Rob. For years, the four of us have simply been friends, you know? We've always joked around a bit. There were a few instances I recall when you playfully pinched my butt or ogled my chest in a swimsuit, but it was all in good fun, and we all understood that. But this, like I mentioned, Joe's behavior was suspicious enough last spring that it's believable he was cheating on me. But Helen? She's the last person I would have ever suspected him of being involved with. She gave me a suspicious look suddenly. Good grief, Rob. You didn't come here to make advances on me, did you? Some sort of revenge hookup or what? For heaven's sake, Steph, I thought you knew me better than that. We've been friends for a long time. You know I care about you. Do you honestly think I'm that much of a jerk? She began to weep, expressing, I'm sorry, Rob. I suppose I'm a bit of a wreck at the moment, not thinking straight. It's difficult right now to hold a favorable view of men if you catch my drift. Please, Steph, remember that both you and I are the ones who have been wronged. You're undoubtedly a beautiful woman, and you know I'm drawn to you. But that's not the point here. I needed you to understand what kind of person your husband really is. I'm going to kick Helen's cheating behind out of my house, and if there's any way I can support you in dealing with Joe, I'm more than willing to do it. I wanted you to know the truth and to know that I'm on your side. That's the sole reason I'm here, believe me. Still in tears, she approached and sat on my lap, right there in the kitchen. She wrapped her arms around me, rested her heat on my shoulder, and cried. After a few minutes, we were both in tears. We probably stayed like that for half an hour. On the nearly six-hour journey to Chicago, I had ample time to reflect. The depth of Helen's betrayal was unfathomable to me. It was evident that she had engaged in numerous affairs, some of which she instigated herself. These clandestine liaisons had persisted for weeks, if not months. What hurt me the most, surpassing all other betrayals, was the shameless affair with these other men. Being with me, she experienced inhibitions, unwillingness to explore the world, and even refused intimacy. And for years, I silently endured this struggle. Nevertheless, she was discovered along with Mark, Joe, and undoubtedly, other people. As I departed Stephanie's house, my mind wrestled with two resolutions. Firstly, my marriage was irretrievably shattered, and Helen would soon regret her actions. Secondly, I needed to confide in my daughters first. Upon reaching Linda via cell phone, she welcomed my unexpected visit with joy. Over a meal at a nearby diner, she updated me on her new job and the fluctuations of her relationship with Chad. Then she confronted me, sensing my underlying tension. All right, Dad, spill it. I'm glad you're here, but there's clearly more to this visit than meets the eye. You've been on edge since you arrived, like you've had four cups of coffee too many this morning. I leaned in close and spoke softly. Darling, I need to tell you something important before anyone else does. Your mother and I are separating. I've discovered that she's been unfaithful to me with multiple men for quite some time. The following hours were difficult. Linda struggled to believe me, and I had to convince her that I was certain about Helen's infidelity, while also shielding her from the most hurtful details. Back at Linda's place, after she finally accepted the truth, she cried inconsolably. I shared in her pain, realizing the shattered image of her parents' relationship was devastating for her. Tears flowed freely that day. I slept on Linda's couch, and before leaving the next morning, I made a request. Please don't confront your mom for a few days, or until she reaches out to you. I need to speak with Veronica today, and then begin the divorce process. After that, your relationship with her is up to you. Remember, your mom loves you dearly, and whatever she did, she did to me, not to you, sweetheart. I arrived at Kenyon around 9 p.m. on Sunday, and my meeting with Veronica mirrored the one with Linda. It was painful, filled with tears, and questions that couldn't be answered. I departed for home early Monday morning. Since I left the city, my mobile phone has been turned off. Now that I turned it on to tell the station chief that I had the day off, I found 11 messages from Helen. 
They ranged from tearful apologies to increasingly desperate pleas. After deleting them, I continued driving, thinking about how to get through the last chapter of our marriage. This situation has devastated me. The union I had put my whole heart into, which I had hoped to keep until the end of my days, has now broken up. It was in ruins. And for what? So that my wife can indulge in meetings, revealing a side of herself that she has never shared with me? I turned to a PBA lawyer I know for a divorce recommendation. When I arrived in the city, I immediately visited the office recommended by the lawyer. After an hour of discussion and the publication of Joe's record, I put the process into action. Since the girls were not at home, custody and alimony issues did not matter. My main concern was the house. If Helen disputes this, I decided to publicly shame her. Other than that, I wasn't much interested in it. At about 4 p.m., when I passed by the house, Helen's car was not there. Good, I thought. After parking in the garage, I arranged for a 24-hour locksmith service. By 6 p.m., when Helen returned, I had made some arrangements. I felt her disappointment and annoyance when she tried to open the front door with a key. I quietly opened it and noticed how the irritation on her face was replaced by a mixture of tenderness and nervousness. Rob, thank God you're back. Where have you been for two days? I was so worried, why didn't you call? She exclaimed. I waved away her questions. Come inside, Helen, please take a seat in the living room. I said calmly. When she tried to hug me, I pulled away and headed into the living room. Puzzled, she trailed after him. Rob, dear, what's going on? Her voice trembled slightly and her eyes reflected concern. Without answering, I motioned for her to sit on the sofa, not taking my gaze off me. Standing in front of her, I studied the worried face of the woman who had held my heart for so many years. I let the silence drag on for a long time before I spoke. Helen, you know, I would never lay a hand on you or do you any harm. You are a woman and once upon a time I loved you very much. She exhaled. Rob, once upon a time, I don't understand. Shut up, I shouted. I exploded, cutting her off. I may not physically harm you, but that doesn't mean I don't want to. So just shut your lying mouth and listen to me. Rob, I am. Shut up, Helen, I growled threateningly. I won't repeat myself. By this point, her complexion had paled with a mix of fear and anxiety. I could observe her hands trembling in her lap. We're going to have a discussion, calmly and respectfully, I continued, and then you'll leave. I'm not concerned about where you'll go, and frankly, I don't care. This marriage is over. Our life together is finished. She gasped, about to say something, but a glance from me silenced her. You've been unfaithful to me with Mark, with Joe Olderman, and it seems with a couple of others as well. I don't know the extent, and frankly, I'm not interested. For months, possibly years, you've been engaging in with other men. You've given them what I've pleaded for, done things with them that you refuse to do for your loving husband, despite my repeated requests. If betraying your spouse through infidelity is a measure, you've taken it to an extreme. All acceptable for someone down the street, and even for one of our closest and oldest friends, but not for the man who has dedicated himself exclusively to you for over 25 years. I genuinely don't recognize you anymore, Helen. I thought I did. But clearly, I was mistaken. I would have sworn on your faithfulness and loyalty with my life. It's fortunate I didn't, isn't it? I glanced at her, seeing her seated motionless on the couch, tears streaming down her cheeks. She had ceased attempting to speak, appearing entranced. I casually pondered what thoughts occupied her mind. Was it something like, Oh no, he must have found out. Or perhaps, perhaps it wasn't worth it in the end. Here's the crux of the matter that truly irks me. You love me. I'm aware of your love for me. We've envisioned growing old together, and I believe you were sincere. Well, guess what? That's your consequence. You don't get to grow old alongside me. You don't get to share a life with me anymore, to wake up beside me every day and cuddle with me at night. You don't even get to reside in this house any longer. I gestured towards three suitcases positioned in the corner. In five minutes, you'll be loading those into your car and driving away, Helen, and you won't be returning. She let out a cry then, catching me off guard. 
No, Rob. Please, baby, you... Yes, baby, I spat out harshly. I can and I will. I'm kicking you out. But first, a few minor details. I advanced towards her until I stood directly in front of her on the couch, looming over her. She recoiled in fear, watching me intently. I slid my wedding ring off and let it fall into her lap. As her eyes widened in astonishment, I seized her left hand and removed her wedding and engagement rings. I dropped the wedding band into her lap as well, but I pocketed the engagement ring. The engagement ring belonged to my grandmother, as you're aware. That's staying with me. As for the wedding rings we exchanged, you're free to do whatever you damn well please with them. Melt them down, toss them away, or stick them wherever you like. They once symbolized our love and commitment, but we both understand their value now, don't we? I strode over to the coffee table and grabbed a stunning glass vase, mostly transparent but gleaming with vibrant blue and green hues. Remember this, Helen. It's from Venice, the fifth anniversary gift we gave each other. It cost a fortune, but we cherished it because it represented our bond. With a swift motion, I hurled the vase to the floor where it shattered into countless pieces, eliciting a cry of anguish from Helen. Not worth keeping anymore, I stated coldly. Turning away, I grabbed two photo albums and flung them into the fireplace. Our wedding album and our family album. All those precious memories, all those reminders of what we meant to each other. But they serve no purpose now, do they, Helen? I bent down to pour lighter fluid on them, then ignited a match and watched as they went up in flames. Helen abruptly lunged towards the fireplace, attempting to halt me with a cry of no. However, I swiftly encircled her waist and guided her back to the couch where she collapsed in tears. Together, we observed as the flames devoured the albums, while I tenderly touched the pocket where I safeguarded the pictures of our daughters rescued from the family book. My recollections of our girls remained invaluable to me. Within minutes, both books turned to ashes. Helen continued to sob, her face averted from mine. All right, Helen, that's enough, I interjected briskly, clapping my hands. The spectacle is over, and it's time for you to leave. Despite my words, she made no attempt to move. Taking her arm firmly, I urged her to her feet and guided her towards the front door. Wait, Rob, please wait, she pleaded, struggling against my grasp. You can't just kick me out like this. Actually, Helen, I can and I will. Her expression betrayed anguish and fear. Without even hearing me out? Without giving me a chance to... to explain? I stepped back, studying her silently for a prolonged moment. Helen, do you honestly believe that anything you could say, any explanation you could offer, would alleviate my pain and betrayal? Is there anything that could make your infidelity, your utter betrayal and humiliation of me, more tolerable? Anything at all that could make this situation less agonizing or less dreadful? But I haven't even had the chance to explain why I... Do you think I give a damn about why? I erupted. Will knowing why you did this bring me solace? All right, everything's fine now that I understand Helen's motivations. Are you delusional? She gazed at me, worn out, terrified, and distressed, wordless. Then, after a prolonged moment, she uttered, but what about the girls? I visited Linda and Ronnie over the weekend. They're aware of your infidelity and my decision to divorce you. Oh no, she exclaimed, collapsing onto the floor in tears. I observed her for a while. My cherished wife, the mother of my children, my life companion, my closest and most trusted friend for 25 years. Then I left her there, sprawled on the floor in the hallway, as I loaded her luggage into the car trunk. Upon returning inside, she sat there, vacant-eyed, staring into space. Silently, I helped her to her feet and guided her outside to the car. The car key rested atop the car, and I positioned her by the driver's side door. I pondered on appropriate parting words, but none came to mind. Goodbye, Helen, felt inadequate for the moment, and fuck you, you cheating cunt, felt cliché. So I simply departed. I re-entered the house and locked the door behind me. Standing there in the hallway, I didn't move, didn't really think. I waited to hear the sound of Helen's car driving away. That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, 
do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!